So I'd like to talk about this idea of playing wide leaps in the left hand. It's where the hand kind of has to find its notes and oftentimes you can't really look, especially if you're reading the score or it's just too fast or, or you have something in the right hand. So this whole idea of um, how to find the right notes when you leap. In this case, this is from an arrangement of love and marriage. Uh, but this kind of pattern occurs in so many works for piano that it might as well apply to just about anything. Uh, whether you play fast or you play slow, the technique is always the same. You prepare your hand and then you move sideways. Right, so you don't play like this and then you move. This wastes too much precious time and so you kind of have to get into this habit of sideways staccato playing whenever you see patterns like this. Now, it's pretty easy to find the first position and get your hand ready before you start. But then, once the metronome starts clicking away, whether real or imaginary, uh, you don't have much wiggle room, but just to keep going, keep going, keep going. And unless you have a way of finding these new positions all the time. Uh, very quickly it turns into this panic-stricken performance where uh, everything feels over, uh, you know, kind of like this. And in order to avoid it, you need to come into it with um, the kind of mindset that says, I know what I'm trying to do here. And if I can't do it, at least I know what I need to practice, as opposed to just hope you land on the right chord. So for instance, without looking down, I mean, I, I know you cannot see my eyes, but I'm currently looking at my screen. I'm looking at the score uh, at the top of the video. And so I'm not actually able to see my uh, hand. Uh, and so how do I know I'm in the right place? Well, here it is. Uh, how, how, how do I know I actually landed correctly? I think the reason I know is because of this trick I use of using the long fingers to feel spaces in between the black keys. So on the one hand, I know roughly that this is the middle of the piano. And of course, this chord right here, um, wrong highlight. So that second chord is roughly in, right in front of me. I need to know I'm sitting right in the middle. Okay, my video is not quite perfectly aligned, but uh, let's see if I can fix it a little bit. Hmm. Maybe a little more. Okay, that's, that's a little better, but in any case, what I'm trying to say is wher wherever <laughs> my nose is, there it is. That's, that's where my middle is. Okay, so roughly as I move hands and nose, you, you can see they're aligned. So I need to make sure I sit in the middle of the uh, keyboard before I start. Otherwise, all these tricks are pretty hard to uh, accomplish. So I put my hand in the middle of the, of the piano as I leap. And right away, at this point in time, I'm feeling that my fingers are on the black keys. Whereas the important part is that, let's assume that that chord here is fingered such that I have one, two, three, five. Some people might prefer one, two, four, five, but it, what specific fingering you use doesn't matter as much as how you use those fingers. Okay. So, one, two, three, five, and that means that my third finger will be the one that lands into this big gap between the black keys. So when I practice this, first of all, I feel this shape. Um, 
with my eyes perhaps looking down to to make sure of things but I want to ultimately look away and know that I feel this shape uh, not so much see this shape so I feel the fact that my third finger is right there in bet in that big gap between the two black keys and that means the E note will be this and the F note would be this that's easy to figure out if I can do this this means my second finger can go over the F sharp right and get stuck on that G there and of course the first finger naturally falls right next to it on A and again my fourth finger goes into that little gap between C sharp D sharp on D and so that means my f first, fi oh, fi first finger fifth finger is on C so that realization just from <laughs> guiding my third finger to the E note uh, is pretty powerful right? I know I'm not on uh, in that gap but I know that I kind of landed on uh, that E flat because I feel the gap with my second finger well quick adjustment right so one more time here's my first beat chord and I'm about to leap boom right it's like I'm just all, only focusing on that sideways motion okay again I landed on E flat and I'm not looking down I'm feeling it because I know it's right in front of me in the middle and I need to find that gap with the third finger another thing that helps is that awareness of octaves we, we're so used to playing octaves on the piano right? that's such a common interval in the left hand especially that from that E to this E I'm kind of somewhat aware of that octave space but more importantly I know that this chord right here is in the middle and the third finger has to find a big gap so one more time there it is so I wouldn't recommend going beyond those two chords un until that concept is internalized if you like by the body and the mind without the use of the eyes so in fact I'll close my eyes and same thing right there that's the gap in right in front of me third finger is feeling it all right so once that's been internalized and you want to actually explore other transitions of course you then go to the next chord uh, or interval in this case let's call, color it red and here it's the opposite muscle group that needs to move my arm uh, moving down what what can we do here how do we find that red colored interval okay well G is sort of first finger note and you can't really feel any black notes with the first finger A is probably fifth finger right makes sense but then it's all these other fingers that are not playing anything that are actually telling me if I am in the right place or not so if you notice my third and fourth fingers are the ones that land on that gap C B A that awareness is what I'm going for right? I know I'm not there because hey my third and fourth finger are feeling this these two black keys and it's the second finger that's in the gap so no problem adjust one more time yellow and now okay again here I didn't quite go far enough and I'm feeling that gap with my fourth finger let's move the third down a little bit I got it one more time and there it is right so again in addition to this feeling of the big black key gap I'm also aware of the fact that this G second uh, second finger yes and that G are an octave apart that octave spacing to me helps me to feel the you might say the gap through these uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure of the right term that kinesthesiologists use okay for, for, forget the name but it's that sort of perception of space through the motion of my body that G to G octave so in other words second finger on G to first finger on G somehow helps me as well 
But I think more importantly is the overall awareness that now I'm going back to roughly this spot. I'm definitely going to not go here. That's too close. I could go here. And so that could be one mistake. I'm, I'm not jumping far enough and I'm landing in this particular uh, wide gap of the black keys. Of course, that's D to C, not A to G, which is the next wide gap. So that would be what I would focus on here. See, that's, that's the easy mistake to make. You don't go far enough. So it's okay. You realize that and you push your hand to go further. But that micro correction that happens once you get to the correct general area, that micro correction happens because of that awareness of this gap. So to summarize this measure, feeling the first gap with my third finger and once I find the thir third finger I know everything else and then once I get from here down to here as soon as I can find that gap with my third and fourth fingers I'm set so here we just do the exact reverse and we go right back to the middle to complete the measure now the big gap let's color it cyan is that D note and of course you would probably play it with finger five now by itself that's a very far away note but again if you think about it as an octave member which just simply doesn't play the top note of this octave so D to D octave and you're just playing the low D now you can kind of use your thumb to go from here and again, remember that fourth finger is on D and you're moving to that D with a thumb. I would use those fourth and third fingers to find that big gap again. Right? So you're using that tactile sensation in your fingers to, to as quickly as possible find these two notes or <laughs> these two keys that you're not going to play so that then you know that you found the D and you only play the fifth finger. Right, so you see, I did quite find that red, but quickly adjusted. Right, I'm feeling that gap and now I know that's a D and I never had to look down on the keyboard. So then it continues, same, same idea throughout. What, what gap shall we find? Let's call it green. What gap should we be looking for here? Mm. I, I have an idea. Right? So this is a small gap with the second finger that we are kind of really zooming in on to play this chord. But what really verifies the fact that we're in the right place because there are so many small gaps, right? That you, you can really find a lot of uh, black keys where that small gap occurs. But the fact that right next to that gap, we have this big space, which I'm feeling with third and fourth. Boom. And again, if I'm aware of how my forearm, uh, not for, well, both things, my upper arm and my forearm feel, when they're playing right in the middle of the keyboard, that really helps me. Kind of feeling that squeeze into the side of my body. And here, I would use fingers three and two to find the F sharp and the G. Now, on this particular occasion, I mostly I'm using the fourth finger because my third will be on the F sharp and my fourth is right here in this big gap kind of confirming that yes this is an F sharp and not let's say G sharp right that where my fourth finger would then end up feeling this F sharp right next to it no this is F, uh, F sharp for the third finger big gap for the for the fourth finger and so I know that's the correct notes 
uh, those are the correct notes. Now, I could go too far, right? And I could go as far as the C sharp instead of F sharp. That's possible. But that, that's something you practice. You practice that perception. And again, I find the fact that this third finger is on C and I'm finding this C, C octave below. Now look, I'm not just playing three and two, right? I'm actually shaping C to C octave where F, F sharp and G are in between. And this allows me to very quickly find the C and essentially repeat the same idea as in measure one, except now we have a slightly easier jump perhaps. Let's see if I color it, let's say orange. How do we find this chord? That's a test right here. So I'm, I've got F sharp, G and a C. I'm about to leap off of the C. Now, did I leap correctly? No, because I'm feeling three black keys under my long fingers. So that's way too far. So let's try it again. Okay, now this is a little easier. This is a little better. I'm feeling a big gap between B flat and C sharp with fingers three and two. That instantly tells me that, hey, right here is my big gap, and right here is my C, right here is my E. So that's pretty good. Did I land correctly? No, because I'm feeling the B big gap with finger three uh, in this space. So no, I need to be like this. Again, I'm never looking down at my hand when I'm finding that chord that I missed. Is that correct? No. That fourth finger is in the gap. I need it to be the second finger, right? So you're kind of learning by feel to find these chords until it becomes, well, fourth nature, third nature, maybe second nature eventually. There it is. But I really, I'm a great believer in just staying focused on a problem until it becomes a little more clear. It doesn't have to be perfect, but these jumps, they're tricky. It's just, there's no question that this is what a lot of pianists spend years and years perfecting. And stride pianists are, of course, known for their excellence in this kind of uh, left hand jumping. Right? You stutter a little bit, you lose that trajectory and suddenly, uh, where am I, you know? You reset, you practice, and just try to perfect the one jump, and eventually you get there. It's just a matter of repeating a specific type of practice. If you try to like do this, you know, and, and that's that's your approach. You're always nervous. You're always barely finding it. You're not practicing the right motion. The, the, the right motion is direct. And if you miss, like I just did, you figure out why you missed, what, what you need to adjust, and you try again. And then eventually your uh, failure rate really reduces to where most of the time your left hand is able to find the right notes. And if it can't, no big deal. Nobody is perfect, right? You just need to kind of keep working, keep working, and the error rate reduces itself gradually. Now, of course, when you're also playing the, the right hand, as in this piece, you know, it has that kind of position shape, a couple of different ways to finger it, but definitely go for the easy way to finger the um, dotted rhythm. Right now, in addition to the left hand, which hopefully by now you've practiced enough to where it makes sense, you, right, we can prepare the first chord in the right hand, we can prepare the first chord in the left, we need to do that instant jump in the left, hopefully all of this is easy, but then let me mark it uh, right here, at that thin indigo line, you need to make sure you're in the right position for the third beat. So 
now, now this is where it begins. Not only do you have to have that awareness of the third and fourth finger in the left hand so you can find the A and G, you also need to make sure you're probably feeling that, you know, I like to play that C with the finger three, the one where it says loco. So if that's my third finger, I need to feel that big gap with my third finger right here. That's pretty tricky. You know, again, you can just practice hands alone for a while to get that going. Good. Okay, but then together. My real preference for isolating these jumping motions and really practicing them on their own is to literally put pause. So I've got, I'm holding, you know, let's color it, let's say thin green, right? I'm holding those notes. Boom, I'm holding, holding, holding. And now all I'm trying to do is jump. So that way I eliminate the need to worry about the actual pressing down of the keys. All I'm working on is the sideways motion to the right positions. Right? I know I, I hit those <laughs> three and four right in that gap pretty solidly, but you could tell something happened to my right hand. Again, I'm not looking down. I'm trying to process what happened by the knowledge of these uh, wide gaps in the black keys. So that's pretty easy. That's just the left hand coordination. But then from the green line, boom. I know I didn't quite hit that gap, but I quickly adjusted. I hit that right hand gap perfectly. So again, just isolating any difficult transition now in both hands and kind of moving simultaneously is the way to practice this. You can't really automate these jumps any other way. The other way you can do it is just to fake it. But, you know, even with me, who has been playing for nearly four decades and obviously have a lot of experience with all kinds of jumpy music, you could hear, I, by not having spent enough time practicing this left hand, quickly I start accumulating a bunch of wrong notes. Now, because I don't stop and I hit at least, what, 70 or so percent of the right ones, the impression is, oh, that's not too bad, you know, I've, I've heard worse. But again, if, you're, if your idea is that perfect, you know, 100% correct note rendition, then yeah, you, you have to do this focused practice of the jumps and not despair that it sometimes takes a while to coordinate both hands together. The trick is don't look down, feel these gaps and always move the hands together. So you, you're not having to think one hand moves, oh, I still have to move the other hand. At brisk tempos, that's a no-no, you just don't have any time for two separate uh, hand motions. It's always synchronized. Right? And even if you practice slowly, notice I'm uh, playing with a very kind of stop and go kind of tempo, but I move instantly. And so then what I do while I stopped, kind of put a pause button, uh, right after B2, I'm analyzing, nope, didn't, didn't move correctly, I should have been here because I'm feeling that big gap with finger two. Ooh, what's going on? Yeah, kind of here, good. Ooh, I wasn't right, was I? I, th I thought that gap was right here and so I ended up hitting those C and D, C, uh, D and C. But that's good, it tells me something. And so I go back and I practice B2. I feel like I got those two gaps. So very important, notice I did not wait until that 16th note right after the thin indigo line. I, I was in position before I played it. And then I played it right into B3. And then I jumped. Now, I think the better fingering here would be two and five and then it kind of puts four onto G, and we can do the staccato A, A B in, in measure two. So from beat three, boom. Here 
you're actually feeling the thumbs of two hands collide. Almost. They're not really supposed to. Well, I guess they are. They, they're sharing A. They're, they're, they are, in fact, slightly touching. Right, so that could be a good thing to practice when you're practicing to jump to beat four. Check that both thumbs are touching each other right above A. You've got that gap with the third finger. And um, I guess in the right hand, where you see five and two, I'm feeling that big gap with fingers two and three. Of course, it's just the right, the left hand that has to move it out to the cyan, um, cyan. What do you call that thing? Highlight. There you go. So, of course, this arrangement pretty much keeps going with that same idea of instant jumps. Occasionally, like in this in the first measure of this next line, it's pretty easy. But then, in the in the final beat, you have to reposition. It's the exact same position as, let me circle it, right here, right, right here. It's all the same stuff. F sharp to G, grace note, um, and the C, where you shape an octave C, C to play it. So there, there will be a lot of similar groups of notes, chords uh, throughout this arrangement and it's typically the case for most arrangements most left hands you're typically playing around with 10 15 different chords and you keep coming back right so again you could see i was mostly correct and then there i went too far well that's because it's hard That C is a, is a wide uh, jump, and I'm aware of that C played with my third finger. Right, so yellow highlight, and I'm about to go to the cyan highlight here. Boom. How do I find it? Well, in addition to the fact that from this C to this C it's an octave, that's good to know. More importantly, again, big gap i'm feeling it with fingers three and four and i know that's my octave if i find it there it is one more time from yellow now i found the gap but i'm also aware that my fifth finger is way too close to my fourth finger so i know that's a d yep there it is so it should be like that i some of you might find using second and third fingers more advantageous, maybe. Like that, right? That's perfectly possible as well. That way your fourth finger goes on D and then you know your fifth finger is on C. So try out different long fingers as your sensors for the black key gaps and see what happens. All right, I hope that was helpful and if not, uh, write me a comment. If it was helpful, write me a comment as well.